Welcome to the School Psychology Review special topic webinar focused on the prejudice reduction and anti-racism professional development in P-12 settings, promise and perils, special topic section featuring guest editors, Jamelia Blake and Pamela Finney and myself as the editor of School Psychology Review. I'll be here with us today as well. I wanted to highlight for those of you who are active on social media, uh, whether you use Twitter or Facebook or Instagram or YouTube, we encourage you to take any screenshots that you want and share them. And if you want to uh, tag the School Psych Review or myself or Dr. Uh, Blake, I know is active, uh, go ahead and do so throughout the session today. You can also access this recording on the SPR YouTube channel for those of that, you that would like to see it later or review it again. So with that, let's go ahead and share some brief information. In terms of this special topic section, some of you have noted that we have done many series of special topics with School Psych Review featuring contemporary research to address next frontier topics that are important to advance not only the field of school psychology, but education in general, and really trying to aim to advance science, practice, and policy that will inform our professional efforts to support children and families and teachers and education professionals at school. And so you can find the full call for submissions located on the NASP website. And for those of you, again, who are active on Twitter and Facebook and other social media, you will see that uh, there's been various broadcasts of the announcement for this special session now uh, over the past couple of months. And we also want to note, which will remind you at the end, for those of you interested in submitting a paper for consideration for the special topic section, or just in general to School Psych Review, you can simply do so at the Taylor and Francis online uh, SPR portal. That's is, uh, featuring the partnership between NASP, the National Association of School Psychologists and Taylor and Francis in uh, currently publishing the School Psych Review Journal. Okay, so we'll go ahead and allow each of the presenters today to share a couple of minutes about their background, their current positions, their background, and their areas of interest and expertise as related to the topics today. So I'll go ahead and turn it over to Dr. Blake. Welcome. Uh, good day. That's probably what we should say instead of good morning or afternoon. Good day. Uh, my name is Jamelia Blake. I'm a professor at Texas A&M University. Um, I study racial ethnic disparities as it relates to exclusionary discipline, particularly as it relates to Black girls. I also study uh, bullying and victimization in socially marginalized populations. Um, I'm delighted that we have the opportunity to uh, do this special topic. Um, something that I think Pam and I have been on our hearts and uh, minds for a long time in our respective lines of work. So to kind of do something and move the field forward, I'm really excited. I'm excited to be here today and, and talk through what we're thinking and impart some knowledge, but I'm really confident that people know a lot already. Um, but share whatever I can share and, and guide you and encourage you to offer some submissions so that um, we can be the change that we want to see, right? Right, Shane, that we can really change our field. So that's all I have to share. I'll, I'll turn it over to uh, Dr. Penning. Hi, everybody. My name is Pam Fenning, and I am a professor at Loyola University, Chicago. And I've been interested in the issue of racial disproportionality in school discipline, exclusionary discipline, suspension and expulsion for many years, and also how that intersects other identities, such as disability status and things of that nature. Um, I'm interested also in discipline policies and how state level administrators and district level administrators can change policy to be, excuse me, become more equitable. And I'm interested also in professional development with administrators around exclusionary discipline and also how to implement more restorative practices and less punitive ones within school settings. And then also the role of us, AKA school psychologists in this work. So thank you, I look forward to this and I'm very excited about the special topic and the opportunity to work with Jamelia and, and, and many others in this process. Excellent. Thank you both. And I briefly mentioned at the onset that uh, my name is Shane Jemerson. I am a professor at the University of California here in Santa Barbara. 
and I'm also editor of the School Psychology Review Journal. Uh, also to note that uh, Dr. Blake serves as one of our senior editors and uh, Dr. Finnings continued to serve uh, as guest editor on multiple important topics that we're featuring in the journal. So thank you to each of you. Uh, over the course of my career, I've had an opportunity to focus on scholarship that addresses how to promote the social, emotional, behavioral, cognitive, and mental health development of children at school and really looking at the breadth of uh, service, support services and interventions and such to meet the needs of all children. Importantly and increasingly recognizing the cultural and linguistic diversity of children in many of our schools throughout the country, certainly here in su Southern California. Uh, we have large populations of uh, Latinx children and uh, other populations of diverse children with languages as well as cultures and backgrounds. And these topics that we're focusing on with, uh, with this particular special session on prejudice and anti-racism and focusing on these efforts of professional development in the P-12 settings are so critically important. They were important a decade ago. They're important five years ago. And we've increasingly seen over the past couple of years the uh, increasing relevance and importance. So I'm really just delighted that Dr. Blake and Dr. Finning have been doing a lot of efforts and a lot of work to prepare this infrastructure and then are going to put in the efforts as well as the editorial board members to review these papers and we'll be featuring these papers uh, in, this, in the journal, subsequently those that are accepted. So the great news is that today, the information that each of them can share can start to be a bit of a foundational knowledge and a primer and provide you with perspective on the topics uh, at large. And also you'll have an opportunity here, we're anticipating that if you have questions, you can use the question answer uh, function within the Zoom webinar, and you can pose questions for the panelists and such, and they might answer them as we go, but we will also hopefully have a little bit of time at the end where we will be able to answer those questions that come up. So with that, let's go ahead and see what's in store for today. We've got the agenda next. There'll be a brief overview of the context and highlighting the importance of this topic. Also describing the purpose of this special topic section as related to the context and importance. We'll briefly describe the types of manuscripts that are uh, likely or uh, for submission and highlight the due date multiple times. And as I mentioned, have an opportunity for question and answers. Okay, so with that, let's go ahead and dive in. I'll turn it over uh, to you folks and you can share a bit of information. Shane, are you going to share your screen? Oh, is that what's happening? Is that it wasn't sharing? <laughs> yeah, okay. I was thinking you look good. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, I should have asked for clarity. Let me do that. That's what's, that's why it wasn't looking as it should look. Okay. Okay, there we go. Sorry okay. about that. As we've been beginning, you've, I guess, just had an opportunity to see each of us, but we'll go ahead and dive in. Wonderful. Well, you know, there was a time when we didn't rely completely on PowerPoint, so I think we get a little addicted to it. So I was ready to roll with the punches as, you know, maybe aka no PowerPoint. Um, but I kind of just to set the context and the stage here, you know, this work with respect to racism, discrimination, prejudice reduction really does tie to our work specifically as school psychologists. This work is tied to the NAS 2020 standards, the new domain eight, which with respect to equitable practice for diverse populations. So you can move on to the next slide, Shane. Sure. So really, how does this pertain specifically to social justice in school psychology? Really at the core of our being as school psychologists, we have an ethical responsibility to engage in social justice and anti-racist action. This comes directly from the unified action statement that was put together last summer um, with respect to our ethical responsibility to work on mitigating racism, discrimination, bias from a social justice lens. Certainly there's been increased attention in the field with respect to defining social justice and how that applies to our work in school psychology and as school psychologists, defining social justice, Schreiberg and colleagues and others have looked at our role in social justice as school psychologists in terms of taking action, in terms of defining social justice from an advocacy oriented perspective. 
Um, more recently and kind of over time, there's been work looking specifically at social justice with respect to distributive justice, which is really that idea of how are, you know, resources distributed and the ways in which they're distributed inequitably through racism, discrimination, prejudice, and bias. And then specifically also procedural justice, which is really this idea of decision making. So under decision making, there can be individual biases that we have under prejudice, discrimination, and racism, meaning when we're sitting around that IEP table and we have students of color, families of color, do they have a voice in our decision making perhaps with respect to IEPs? But then also there's the other component which has to do with cultural justice, which has to do with that idea of how are specific groups, minoritized oppressed groups, limited from access to resources, education, even as a property right. Um, so, you know, really this special series is a wonderful opportunity to think through how we're engaged in social justice work, particularly with P-12 students. Um, so at this point, we'll turn it over now to Jamelia for the next slide. Okay, so next slide, please. So um, thanks, Pam, you really set this up well for me. Can y'all see me? I don't know if you can, can you hear me? Okay, cool. Um, so. This is something that we've been grappling with for more than 60 years, right? How do we educate racially and ethnically diverse children? Particularly, we're talking about Black, Indigenous, Latinx youth, and also um, youth of various um, Asian ethnicities, right? So there's a lot of diversity in terms of being Asian um, in this country. And so we've grappled with this. And if you look at our field, um, well, be, even beyond our field, right? So with Brown versus Board of Education and even beyond that, we've grappled with how to provide the best quality education. And so what we know or should know as school psychologists or school psychologists in preparation is that um, we have a, an opportunity gap. Um, I take this from one of my esteemed colleagues at Michigan State University, Tara Vincent Chambers. She uh, is a uh, educational policy expert. And she says, I don't like this achievement gap. This is an opportunity gap because this is about um, as much as it's about resources as it is performance. And a lack of resources can lead to deficits in performance. And so what we've been talking about in the field of education broadly and special education, and that has eventually trickled down to school psychology, is that we have these, what seems to be intractable discrepancies in academic outcomes. And we see this all the way from preschool, right, pre-K, preschool, all the way through post-secondary um, college, even to the point of, you know, not only just test scores, standardized test scores, but in terms of course selection, right, advanced placement, um, progress academically, who gets put in special ed? That's something that we're very comfortable talking about in, in school psychology because of our connection to special education. But these discrepancies are broader and more disparate. So we're, we're really comfortable about recognizing that and talking about it. The other thing that we've been talking about for a very long time um, in various ways is, um, and, I, and I, I wanna provide this historical lens because um, no shade, but I really feel like we have a lot of enthusiastic people, but I want you to do the work. I want you to know that these things are not new phenomenon, not in the last five years, not in the last 10 years. You know, exclusionary discipline, we've been talking about since 1975. That was before I was born. Just dating myself right there, tell you how old I am, right? You know, so we've been talking about this. There have been goats, if you will, you know, really esteemed people, Russell Steve, uh, um, other scholars who've been talking, Dan Lawson, who've been talking about this for a long time. And so we, we know um, because of the recent national attention in the last you know, five or seven years that, okay, not only are we um, over-disciplining in the form of suspension and expulsion, you know, students of colors and students with disability, and now we are recognizing metaphorically that the over-disciplining can have long-term implications in terms of providing youth with contact with the, the juvenile justice system or the criminal justice system rather, right? But we also know that this happens with intersectional lens. So people are looking at the intersection of gender and race, looking at how black girls, right? Indigenous girls, indigenous boys are being over-disciplined. And there are even some colleagues who are looking at this in terms of um, sexual orientation, right? So looking at 
the over-discipline of GLBTQ plus right youth and the intersection of race and how that's happening. So we're talking more and more about the school to prison pipeline and in our field, um, and, and not to hate on our field, we're making progress, but historically, school psychology has not been comfortable talking about kind of inequity and, and diversity, whereas some of the other sub-disciplines of health service psychology have and made a lot more progress. So we're talking about these things now, and we're, we're no longer having to prove that, that these um, associations exist, right? And what's also happening is that in addition to having this relationship between disparate practice and exclusionary discipline, we're seeing the connection, how that then um, enhances, if not magnifies, the achievement discrepancy that we have known existed for a long time. So these, this is kind of the push for um, this special issue is that we've had these longstanding problems. And um, I'm going to turn for Pam, but before I do, what I want us to think about is, and I tell my my graduate students, also good. we're really good at problematizing in our field. We're really good at pointing to what's wrong. But if we're going to move forward, we got to figure out how do we remove what's wrong. So for that, I'll turn it over to Pam. Thank you so much, Jamelia. So I think, um, next slide, thank you, um, is really this idea that, you know, it's one of those things in our field that with racism, discrimination, bias that cuts across achievement, it cuts across criminal justice, it cuts across education, it cuts, cuts across all aspects of education and related lived experience of person of color and individuals of other intersected uh, oppressed identities is that, you know, unfortunately, I would say in our field, broadly speaking, we have admired this problem, you know, for many, many years and, and really worked on, you know, disproving what we're seeing time and time again, as Jamelia pointed out, since 1975 on discipline, but really for centuries, right, across our, our country since the origins of education. And the other piece is that um, as we move towards thinking about solutions and remedies with respect to racism, discrimination, bias, educational disparities, it's really this notion uh, perhaps of moving away from a deficit view of persons of color to one in which we are, you know, not saying, hey, it's because of poverty or, oh, it's because it's uh, our families are poor, our families are facing socioeconomic status issues. Those things may be true because of historic racism and bias and discrimination, but when we look at an individual student student deficit lens, then we are not forced or we're not called to action as school psychologists to do anything that remedies the issue, right, with looking at school practices, with looking at those alterable actions. So the opportunity for this special series is really to look at, you know, in P-12 settings, how can we actually look at solutions that are viable with respect to mitigating the racism, bias, discrimination that we've seen really for centuries with respect to work, professional development, others, interventions, implementation of practices in P-12 settings where our students and children are and exist. Um, so it's really kind of also thinking and, and challenging our thinking of moving away from a deficit perspective, an individual student deficit perspective, which perhaps comes from our long history, at least to some extent, of special education evaluations where we have to show deficits, difficulty, issues, problematize the issue as residing within that individual student. And then we're not looking at ourselves, our school practices, discrimination, bias, interchanges in the classroom and the like that actually are much more proven to contribute to the disparities that we see than any, you know, any individual student deficit. So, um, and we, you know, fail to also honor the strengths and resiliency of um, our colleagues, our students that are from minoritized, historically oppressed groups um, and backgrounds. So, um, so really, it's kind of this opportunity of how do we move towards school practices and, and begin and continue this conversation in this special series really focused on, on P-12 settings and the work being done in P-12 settings. So I'll turn it back over to Jamelia for the next, next slide. slide, please, Shane. So um, as kind of Shane alluded to and, and Pam, we are just, I'm excited and afraid at the same time, right? Um, I'm afraid because of what's happening in our society, but we have this potential where our field is evolving right before my eyes. You know, I never thought, and first of all, it shows you how old I am, right? We get old. But I, I didn't, I, if you would have asked me this, you know, I don't know, 10 years ago, what I think that our field would be here, I'd be like, nah, just publishing counts and psych. So I'm so excited that we are at this point. But 
we're at this point in our society where there's this societal unrest and awakening, right? So some of us have been here for a long time and some of us are just entering and becoming aware of things that were very apparent um, to the rest of us and that's okay. But um, what's happening, and you can see this in the media, you can see this in policy um, and, and the way that you know, uh, laws and policies are unfolding that whether we agree with it fully or not, there's the slow recognition of the pervasiveness of anti-Blackness and racism against um, a number of people of color, indigenous um, communities, Asian communities, Latinx communities. And we're seeing this kind of unfolding in our society in many, many systems, right? And you know, the beauty um, of technology is that the invisible is now becoming visible, right? Because we're getting to see these things, unfortunately, unhappening, um, unfold right before our eyes. So this, this societal awakening, if you will, due to the systemic oppression that's happening has forced many of us who have not considered this um, as relevant to our lives or haven't been forced to think about this to start to recognize that racism is embedded in our systems. And what that means is that we've talked about and we can look on online and the media, we can see where racism is embedded in our criminal justice system, right? Who is seen as a, as a, a criminal and who is seen as a victim and who, what are the legal, legal repercussions for some actions? We also see this in our healthcare system. Who gets access to care? Who is deemed um, you know, as being appropriate. The, the emphasis now on the opiate crisis as something that we need to help is very different than, and some of you might be too young for this, about how we viewed heroin and the crack epidemic, you know, in the 80s and 90s when I was growing up. There's this shift and, it, and it's really peeling back um, the systemic nature of racism. And as school psychologists, we are, many of us should be familiar with uh, Bond from Brenner's right, ecological systems theory, right? And we have to recognize and accept that if all these things are happening and these, this racism is embedded in our, in our various systems that we live in, schools are not immune, right? So we're in this watershed moment, right? This shift in the field where um, those of us who are on the fringe who have been talking about this for a long time, we now have, as I said, we've been talking about this since 1975. We now have, what, over 40 years of research in, in various formats from different scholars that really um, convey and indicate um, about anti-Blackness and racism, how pervasive it is. So this is, we no longer have to prove, right? Earlier in the field, Pam, Sherry and I, Scott Graves, Marquita Newell, there were, uh, Frank Worrell, there were a lot of us doing, Amanda Sullivan, doing work to kind of established this foundation that like, this is a problem that you need to look at. We don't need to do that anymore. You know, what, what really kind of drives my work is how is it happening? Why is it happening? And how do we fix it? I have to talk to my students about, this is controversial, but, controversial, but I grew up watching the Cosby show. Cosby show, he's, you know, he's a problem. We can talk about that another time, how you feel about that. But the Cosby show, the same issues that they were talking about the Cosby show when I was a kid are the same issues that we're talking about right now. So how is it in the past 30 years um, that we have not been able to make progress and shift these issues, right? It again speaks to the system, systemic nature of these problems and our um, lack of of willingness to kind of combat this. Uh, next slide, please, Shane. So I'm really, it's really important to me that I impress upon you um, that we look at this, at these issues, these educational disparities that we're talking about from a broader perspective, right? Um, and some of these factors we may be able to shift, but some of them um, we cannot. So as as Pam kind of alluded to, we have all been trained in a deficit-based perspective, in part from that really roots in the medical model that then impacts how we view special education and disability status. That is really fundamental to our training. And that is how psychologists historically have been trained, right? And so we have in the last decade with 
the um, uh, more than a decade, 20 years with the integration of prevention science, we start to started to embody more sociological um, systemic concepts and recognizing how these various systems interact to produce the outcomes that we are seeing that's affecting certain communities. So um, I really like this graphic and I like graphics a lot because it illustrates my point. So I wanna talk about some of the systems that we need to think about that ultimately lead to academic achievement discrepancies or the opportunity gap and exclusionary discipline. So, um, and some of these things we can't really address as school psychologists on an individual level, but it's still important that we recognize this. One, we have to look at the communities, right? The fundings. I once met a wise administrator who said, listen, the degree to which a school can do something depends on the community that they're in, right? And if those communities don't have appropriate funding or resources, the school system becomes a de facto service provider. And I think many of you can attest to that. That if you're in a community that's underfunded, underserved, then by default, whether that's mental health, whether that's academic difficulties, whether that's physical health, that then falls on the school system to provide those services, right? So we need to be thinking about, we really need to embrace this idea of broader systems, right? And so we also need to be thinking about school funding. What types of resources do school systems have? I talk a lot about this in my class and I get students to really think about our tax structure, right? And if you have communities where you don't have, um, we have a lot of low income housing or you have people who don't have jobs or there's not a lot of employment, there's not going to be because of the way that we structure um, the way that schools receive funding in most cities and states is based on the tax structure of that neighborhood, right, of that state. So if you have communities that don't have significant employment, right, that have income coming in, then you're going to have lower funded schools, right? And that's not something we as school psychologists can think about. But the reason why I like this graphic is you can't look at each of these areas independently. Structural racism is this idea that, or this theory that we have these structural forces based on racist policies that then influence these systems. So I'm not gonna get too historical, but right, like when we talk about neighborhoods and residential areas, we have to think about redlining and the historical impact of who was able to buy homes, right? We need to think about, when we talk about communities and what resources they have, we need to think about what is the employment um, opportunities look like and what is access to those employment opportunities and who makes those decisions and how have historical and oppressive and racist structures contributed to the limited opportunities. I'm not implying that there are not, um, there's never self-agency. There's always self-agency. Um, and I'm not overly deterministic in my theoretical perspective, but I do think that, you know, oftentimes because of structural racism, because of the systemic oppression, we have communities where there are restricted opportunities. So if you get to a fork in the road and you can only go left or go right, we have then restricted your opportunities of choice. And that's what structural racism does. And it's important to talk about kind of these neighborhood structures and school funding, not in the sense that I expect you to, as a professional, go out and change that, although you can do that on the individual level, but to recognize that these things are intertwined and interconnected. And although that is not the focus of this special issue, you cannot, we cannot talk about the racial ethnic disparities we see in education without recognizing the broader impact um, of all of these areas and how structural racism has an impact on that. Um, if you could go to the uh, next slide, please. So, um, and Pam and I are gonna talk about this together. So the, the pink, uh, I think that's a hexagon do my math right there, I think it's a hexagon. So the pink hexagon is really the outcomes we see, right? I wanna talk a little bit about um, some of the other areas that we can target that uh, uh, Pam spoke to. So she's gonna speak more to kind of educational policies and practices, which I think are really important, but I wanna talk about what happens within the school system, right? And that, that leads us to get to these racial ethnic disparities. So some of that is pedagogy, right? And the way that educators are taught to think about instruction and how they teach and convey information. 
And it's really important in school psychology, we can become very insular, which means that we only stay in the realm of school psychology. But the history of our field is that it truly is interdisciplinary. We are trained both as health service psychologists with significant expertise in mental health. We're trained as expertise in um, special education, particularly as it relates to identification, but also behavior right, behavioral principles, and then we are tra trained in education broadly. So we are by virtue of really an interdisciplinary field. And what that means for yourself in a special issue is that you have to go out of the realm of school psychology into these other areas. So in um, teaching, learning, and instruction, the preparation of pre-service teachers, they've actually spent a lot of time talking about how do we prepare teachers for educating a diverse student body, right? And a lot of that work has come from multiculturalism or culturally responsive pedagogy. And culturally responsive pedagogy, because this is a hot button topic, is not the same as critical race theory, okay? Critical race theory is a legal theoretical lens um, that is important, that is um, useful for framing the inequities and structural racism that we see to help people kind of compartmentalize and understand the legal criminal justice system, and it can be extended to education. But culturally responsive pedagogy is at the practitioner level. And so is multiculturalism, right? And that's the, that's the people who are in the school systems doing the work. And it's really about how do I make this curriculum? How do I make my instructional strategies? How is the way I think about learning going to be appropriate and aligned with the cultural background of my students so they can take this up. I have a great friend, Dr. John Singer. He tells me, um, he uses this great analogy. So if someone puts food in front of you and you do not eat it, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're not hungry. It means that the food they pre prepare for you is not something that they're interested in eating. And what culturally res re responsive pedagogy suggests is that we look at the food being education and the way that we're delivering it. And we look at ways that we can make it acceptable and um, useful to the children that we're teaching, right? And multiculturalism is really about the integration of different cultures, understanding how different perspectives they can enhance our ability to relate and instruct. So there's research out there talking about how are teachers prepared to do this, right? And, and this is really important for this special issue because we can't talk about how we address prejudice or anti-racism without understanding the fundamentals of this existing work that's there. So one way of thinking about how we combat these disparities that we see in education is what is the pedagogy um, in, in school psychology, we would call it our theoretical perspective. Um, if you want to call it your cultural frame that prepares teachers for working with students and addressing the issues that we see. On the other hand, just the preparation of educators a different way. So beyond just the theoretical frameworks, what are we actually doing to prepare teachers to kind of combat and address these issues, right? So um, my colleagues who are in K through 12 um, instruction in various instructional modalities, they're training pre-service teachers. So what are they doing to prepare pre-service teachers to address these disparities? For those of us as school psychologists, professional development becomes an area for practicing teachers. What does that look like? How are we preparing them to address achieving an exclusionary um, discipline? And to what extent are we integrating theories about culturally responsive pedagogy, multiculturalism, and recognizing the historical impacts of structural racism. And then in school psychology, my colleague Marquita Newell, right, she's done a lot on, um, as well as others, multicultural consultation, right? To what extent are we using as school psychologists these models to support teachers, right, in their understanding, their cultural competency, and their actual instructional practices to address these educational disparities. So in order to really attack these, these, these disparities that we're seeing, we're going to have to really put the ecological systems theory into practice, but we're gonna to have to do that from a critical and cultural lens 
and be comfortable and be willing to talk about the degree to which structural racism impacts all of these factors that shape the educational outcomes that we see among students. So with that, I wanna give Pam an opportunity to talk about educational policies, which is also relevant. Thank you so much, Janelia. So you've hit on so many critical, important topics and, and areas of focus. And so just adding a little bit to that would be, you know, I think, and I think Janelia alluded, alluded to it earlier as well, as I think in school psychology, in our field of understanding racism, bias, educational disparities, we're behind in my opinion, different fields, related fields, such as counseling, psychology, other related fields. So, so also that interdisciplinary piece is really critical and important for us. Uh, a colleague, our colleague Celeste Malone shared a great article called um, Radical Healing by French and colleagues. And so counseling psychology, it's a wonderful, beautiful article, French et al 2020. Um, so it really is an important framework, you know, in terms of radical healing with respect to communities of color. And again, kind of going beyond that individual deficit view that, um, you know, I think perhaps we've held in, in our field of school psychology collectively and individually. So part of it is um, in terms of school psychology, attacking our own biases, our own prejudice, the own discrimination that we bring to the table in doing that work around, you know, mitigating our own biases, learning and understanding more about structural racism that Jamelia spoke of so eloquently and beautifully a minute ago. And I think the other piece too is really this interdisciplinary lens, right? So as Jamelia spoke of earlier, we look at educational disparities because there's where we are nine to three in the afternoon, but we need to understand the community. We need to understand how that ties to criminal justice, that ties to the communities where students, you know, are facing, you know, historical racism, oppression across all multiple life spheres. So there's a lot we can learn in our field of school psychology from other disciplines, related disciplines, law, public policy, counseling, psychology, others are looking at this issue in a broad way, and perhaps in a way that we have not historically in our field of school psychology. So now is an opportunity for us to really look at our role and, and I think our complicit role in racism and discrimination and bias, and then also how we can look at and learn from other colleagues who are in related discipline. So that feeds a little bit into our role as school psychologists day to day, knee to knee with students, right, from nine to three in the P12 setting. But then also, how do we get around the table around educational policies that really do have an impact macro level? Jamelia mentioned Bronfenbrenner and the ecological perspective. It's just not a surprise that educational policies have been historically racist, right? And so we have our individual P12 student interactions and those practices are really, really important. But our uh, knowledge and learning also and being humble and saying we need to gain knowledge ourselves, but then also being around the table when statewide discipline reform actually does happen and does occur because that does impact at the micro level that day-to-day -day interchange with students. And so, for example, doing some work at the state level with different administrators, one thing I've noticed is that we want to have a quick remedy and a quick solution. So let's say, okay, plop in a program there, right? But if we prop, uh, pop in a program, but we don't understand the historical context of discrimination, racism, bias, then it's likely to fail. So it's not surprising that just taking a program and popping that in a school, unfortunately, we haven't seen any real change, measurable change in racism, discrimination, bias, oppression that we've seen. So really getting ourselves around the table improving and learning and being humble ourselves and then participating in statewide discipline reform and working with colleagues that are at the state level those state level decision makers who will often want a very quick solution to a very complex issue that we're describing here and so it's really incumbent upon us to say wait hold up here <laughs> like we have to have a a real you know, comprehensive conversation around this issue and educate ourselves. So, so one of the pieces might be looking at, you know, I, in my state, you know, we're doing a lot of work on re, uh, restorative justice, which I think is really, really critical and really wonderful approach to take a look at, but then how do we have that conversation without thinking about racial justice embedded in that? So, so for example, Fania Davis and some of her work, she's in a related field, but she's done really beautiful work around looking at racial restorative justice and also looking at some of 
the systemic racism that does feed into the outcomes that Jamelia spoke of. You know, it's not surprising that we see opportunity gaps when in fact we have statewide and federal policies that are biased and discriminatory. Now, can we change that day to day? You know, we may not in our daily role as school psychologists or trainers of school psychologists, but I think, you know, we have important uh, conversations that we can participate in around policy changes. And then also, I, Jamelia um, spoke of this earlier too, but how are educators prepared to engage in culturally responsive pedagogy in the classroom? How can we work on providing coaching and support and also being humble and learning ourselves? Administrators make key decisions, right? And so I work often with administrators and they don't necessarily have the training around school discipline, opportunity gaps and the like. And so I think that's where that interdisciplinary piece comes in and how in school psychology, we have a long way to go, but we should be around that table on some of these broad decisions. So that's what I'm thinking about when I think about that role of educational policies, because that does impact what happens in the P-12 setting. So I will stop talking or I'll talk the rest of the day and we can just <laughs> look to the next slide. <laughs> yeah. So the next slide, please. Okay, so let's let's get at the, the meat and potatoes while you're here. Um, so when Pam and I were, I think Pam has started like at NAS at one point in time, like two years ago. I'm guilty of that. Like I'll just approach you with some random idea and then it'll take me like two or three years to bring it together. But um, when when Pam and I were just talking about our respective work and you know, I'm an admirer of Pam and everyone in the field, um, we really want this, this special topic to focus on um, P-12 educators and administrators. And here's why, um, from my perspective, and I'll let Pam chime in. I think that we're really comfortable, and, and this is not that this is not something that should happen, it's important, but we're really comfortable at addressing our interventions at students and our trainings as students. Um, when I mean students, I mean P-12 students. And I think that that's very important. Um, but a colleague of mine, Thomas Farmer, he uses this metaphor called the invisible hand. And he, and he uses it in the sense of using teachers to impact the social dynamics in the classroom. And I think that we know um, as school psychologists that teachers, educational administrators um, are gonna be um, as powerful, if not more powerful sources of intervention to really change um, educational outcomes. Um, for students. So it's not that I, I don't want to discourage people who are doing the work on interventions focused with students. I think that's really important and we need that. But we also need policies, programs, interventions targeted at the educators who have that um, procedural justice, that, that, that authority to make decisions that then impact students. And so the focus, the target audience that we want in terms of the type of manuscripts should really be focused on um, educators, administrators, other professionals. I mean, education and administration can be broadly, but really focus on the school setting and those individuals who have some degree of authority to impact the instructional learning environment and the setting of students. Um, and we were also really clear that we recognize that there's a, layers of oppression that it's not just students of color or racially, ethnically diverse students who experience oppression, but for um, so that we can have focus. This issue really focuses on anti-racism, racism, prejudice reduction, and bias as it relates to ethnically and racially diverse students. So mitigating racism. Now there certainly can be intersection identities, and we want to encourage you of thinking about that, but the focus really is on mitigating anti-racism and bias. Um, and so kind of the four broad topics, but there's certainly room for development is uh, promising professional development trainings, addressing racism, anti-racism, prejudice, or bias. This is where we come in with that implicit bias training or, um, you know, there's been PBIS, culture response, culture responsive PBIS. There's been a number of different um, interventions that teachers can impact, but how do we prepare these teachers to have these conversations, right? To engage in these practices. Um, the other thing to think about, because we do love assessment in school psychology, we can't let it go, right? Is what type of assessment tools are out there? 
So if I'm a district administrator, right, I think this is really important. I think this is one that I added that a Pam nodded to. But if I'm a district administrator, how do I evaluate if the diversity-based professional development trainings that I'm implementing are working? How do I evaluate if they're working for changing belief systems, ideals within my teacher, but also more broadly in my system? right, in my school system? What are the outcomes? So that, when I say assessment tools, that can be an actual measure, or maybe that's a suite of measures, right? Maybe that's a de de uh, decision-making framework, right? Um, I know Ann has done some work on that, on decision-making, but how do we evaluate where these trainings are working? Um, this is really close to my heart because whether we provide the evidence-based space or not, school districts are, uh, many school districts are, um, engaging in this work, they will engage in this work, and they're going to continue to engage in this work. And what we want to be able to do is provide evidence-based um, interventions, practices, and measures that are feasible for school districts. Although this is not on here, something else that just off the top of my head that I think is really important is um, even thinking more broadly, how do school districts and systems decide who's going to deliver these prejudices reduction, diversity, inclusion, uh, professional development trainings. How do they decide this? This is something that is, that is a, I think, for many of us scholars, is something that we think about is what, what, who gets to come into these systems and what kind of credibility and credentials do they need, right? Because one of the challenges that we face is um, how effective are these professional development trainings, right? And really altering the behavior, the practices of teachers. Um, so one of the other things is thinking about models of professional development um, or consultation to support P-12 educators in the implementation of anti-racist or culturally salient policies and practices. This is particularly important for us as school psychologists, um, getting a seat at that table. And also, as we think about this, how do we train the next generation of school psychologists to mitigate racism, prejudice, and bias? What does that look like? What does, what does that mean, right? So we have some good models from counseling. I think many of us are integrating themes of culture um, and diversity and equity and inclusion in, in our classes, throughout our classes. We have a lot of support from NAS and Division 16 and Division 45. But, you know, I always talk to my students about um, these difficult dialogues. And it's very easy to talk about this on a very cognitive, conceptual level, but what happens when you're at that IEP and <laughs> you can very much see things are going off the rails and you can see whether you wanna call that out as racism or bias, you can see things are changing. What skill set are we providing to our students to at that moment intervene and mitigate this process? So that involves more than just these broad theoretical conceptual ideas, but in terms of specific skill set and strategies and language and things that they can specifically do that don't set administrators on guard on the defense or the individuals who are talking, but still end up having us advocate for children, right? So, so these are some of those topics. Um, Pam, do you want to add anything? No, I think you did a, a great job covering, you know, all the, the key topics and, you know, perhaps there's some we haven't thought about that will be coming our way with novel, you know, excellent ideas, but I, I definitely resonates with me the focus on adults and really thinking about, you know, changes in our adult behavior in classrooms, um, not to say that we're not interested in student, you know, delivered interventions, but thinking about, you know, how do we position ourselves and other educators contextually to really look at, you know, professional development training um, that, you know, we could partake in ourselves as well. And, and your other point, Jamelia, really resonates with me around, you know, who gets to do this professional development and what credentials and and what background, right? And honestly, our own individual identities, race, you know, like I'm white, it's I'm gonna be perceived differently, right? Sitting around that IEP table than, than a colleague of color. And those are real conversations that happen. And those are our conversations that we have with our students because it's all great and well and good to say, you know, mitigate and, you know, mitigate microaggressions, other things that are happening. And then there's the reality of schools um, and where our students work. Um, so kind of a multi 
pronged approach as far as, you know, those the key decision makers, you know, back to the procedural justice um, decision around administrators and what decisions they're making and, and how we can position multiple, you know, who are those adults that impinge children and families every day. Um, so this is a, a long way, I would say, for us to go, but I think also a golden opportunity in our field to really um, to wrap our heads around this issue at this watershed moment. Thanks, Pam. Okay, next slide, please, Shane. Um, so these are the type of manuscripts that we're um, encouraging you to submit, but you know, I think this covers everything, honestly. So empirical evaluations, uh, brief reports of pilot studies, um, systematic literature reviews and meta-analyses, measurement development and validation studies. I wanna say that I think what's exciting about this is that we're, we're doing this, but it's also, I wanna say that I recognize there may not be as much work out there, but I think in terms of like published studies, but I think that um, if we go beyond our field, we may find more and I'm excited to see, I, I do think people are doing the work. I just think that we have to give them an outlet um, to showcase that work. So um, these are the kind of manuscripts, but of course, you know, open to other dial, um, other options, having conversations. Next slide, Shane, please. So um, one of the questions we get is about manuscript length, and I'm going to turn this over to Shane to, to speak a little bit about. He gave a really good explanation to Pam and I. But um, Shane, you wanna you wanna take the lead here? Sure. Thank you. Okay, yes, cool. it's been fantastic information that each of you have presented. Uh, but just in brief, just mentioning in terms of manuscript length, as you're thinking about uh, possibly preparing a paper for submission to the special topic section, the uh, journal does uh, feature brief reports of pilot studies. And so these are papers that are no longer than 15 page pages all inclusive. There are specific uh, detailed guidelines for the preparation of brief uh, reports that are provided in the instructions to authors on the Taylor and Francis SPR website. Also, in terms of uh, welcoming and encouraging systematic literature reviews and meta-analyses, as well as measurement development and validation studies and, and other methodologies and such, recognizing that the recommended length uh, in preparing your paper is 30 pages all-inclusive, including references, tables, figures, content, and such abstract, and not to exceed 35 pages. Now note that there are opportunities to also submit supplementary online materials to the degree that there are uh, certain tables or additional information that you believe should be directly linked to the paper when it's published in the uh, journal issue. Again, it is a, a digital issue. So readers that are reading your uh, article would then be able to click on the supplemental online materials and find access to those items that uh, you might identify that would go beyond say the 35 pages and of course what we value the most is the quality of the content and the contribution and as dr blake had just recently highlighted we're, we're seeking to provide an outlet for the important research and scholarship that's that's occurring out there and uh in the field of school psychology and beyond so certainly share with uh, colleagues in allied disciplines and, and other arenas and areas of emphasis but uh, ultimately, it's the quality that's the most important, the most essential, and we'll work with you as uh, action editors and reviewers to navigate that review process uh, if you choose to submit a paper for consideration. And I know we're getting short on time here. I just want to briefly mention, and we'll see if we have time for a quick question and answer, uh, but the due date for submissions is September 15th. I've shared in the chat the link to uh, the Taylor & Francis SPR website where you can find more information as well as the NAS um, call for papers where you can find additional information. If you do submit a paper, uh, this is the portal here. If you go on to the Taylor and Francis SPR website, there's instruction for authors. You can click on that. And just wanted to note that we do uh, place a premium on providing uh, thoughtful, timely, and high quality constructive reviews of papers submitted to the journal, the editorial board members, the action editors, the guest editors, everyone all inclusive are super committed to that generally it's uh, under 30 days from submission to decision feedback 
And uh, presently we've been averaging over this first year about 20 days on average, some a little bit more, some a little bit less, uh, that's an average. So we want to um, again say thank you for your participation today. As I noted in the chat, there's been a lot of students, a lot of uh, practitioners, a lot of faculty, scholars, uh, allied professionals out there. And uh, we can quickly, I don't see any particular questions that are in the queue. If anyone had one they wanted to pop in there real quick, then you're welcome to. But Dr. Blake or Dr. Finney may also have any additional um, closing remarks if there are no questions that pop up. Uh, does anybody have any questions? I live for questions, actually. It's like my favorite part of presentations. <laughs> Bueller. Okay. Um, all right, well, just hit me up if you have any, but um, I just want you to be encouraged. I feel like, um, you know, my father used to tell me this growing up, <laughs> don't tell yourself no, let them tell you no. So my thought is, um, and I know that sounds a lot because there's a lot of uh, blood, sweat, and tears that go into writing manuscripts and um, proposing ideas, but I really do believe just in my conversations of being at NAS and many people that there are people who are doing really good work and um you know we just need to find uh outlets that are welcoming to that work so definitely encourage you to submit things um also reach out to me pam or shane via email or on um, twitter or social media i think that sometimes uh, especially people new to publishing don't realize that you can completely talk through an idea and see if it's a good fit um, I would be happy to do that. Um, you know, of course it gets blinded, so it'll tell me all the titles and everything else, but, you know, loose ideas of what, what you're thinking about and share it with me and we could, we could talk it through to see if it's a good fit. Um, but I just want to encourage you to, to showcase the work that I know many of you are doing and the ideas that you're doing. And if this is not the right special issue, we're just beginning. So there'll be another one, don't worry. You know, there'll be another one if this is not it. Oh, there's a Q&A, I think. It says, will you guys prefer empirical studies that involve data already collected? It's a good question. Um, can you elaborate on what you mean by that? Do you mean, because sometimes you can have a, like a conceptual model or like a proposal. And I think Shane can speak to this, like in the brief report thing. So I'm thinking about if you're a school practitioner, you guys have been doing some trainings and you've done it for more of our like a program evaluation standpoint. So you may only have data on this particular campus or this district, um, that would be good. But if you don't have data, then we're talking more about a kind of conceptual piece. And so that is welcome as well. Um, or like kind of a model for how you do professional development. I would be, I mean, I think I can speak for Pam and I, that would be open, but if you can elaborate on that, that would be helpful as, as well. Yes, I agree with what Dr. Blake had just highlighted. And uh, if you have additional elaborations and or feel free to reach out via email, as Dr. Blake had mentioned, Dr. Blake, Dr. Finney and I are each available. So uh, you can find our emails readily available online there. And uh, I know that it's just uh, at the 11 o'clock hour here in California, at different times, different places, but uh, in respect and appreciation and uh, wanna express gratitude to our presenters today, Dr. Jamelia Blake, Dr. Pamela Finning, uh, such uh, tremendously valuable information that each of you shared and highlighted and recognized the importance of these efforts uh, to be featured in school psychology and we are, uh, incredibly honored to feature these contents forthcoming in School Psychology Review. And as noted in the presentation, as we were sharing information today, I did feature many links to recently accepted articles that will be published. Some of them have recently been published in School Psych Review that specifically are highlighting some of these critically important topics that both Dr. Blake and Dr. Finning had noted today. So, so thank you so much. It critically essential topic, so important. And thank you, Dr. Blake, Dr. Finning for your presentation today and your ongoing efforts uh, historically, but ongoing, upcoming, especially uh, forthcoming with this special topic section. And for all of those that need to do the Zoom shuffle or otherwise get to their next activity, uh, we'll let you go. And we want to again say thank you 
And we look forward to many further conversations, communications, and for some of you submissions for this uh, special topic school, uh, school psychology review uh, section. So thank you. Thank you. Grateful.